Once an industrial hub to now a leader in the green building movement, there is much to see and learn about Pittsburgh's architecture. Some of the most beautiful architecture in the nation can be found in Pittsburgh's region. The skyscrapers, churches, theaters, historic buildings, and bridges show the brilliance of architects of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In fact, it is needless to say that the architecture of Pittsburgh ties greatly into this city's history and origin as well. The Union Trust Building, a major historical landmark, was built in 1916 by Henry Clay Frick during a time when Pittsburgh was experiencing rapid growth and was originally named the Union Arcade. This structure was and is currently a hub for economic activity and a symbol of Pittsburgh's rich history. We were the former site of uh, St. Paul's Roman Catholic Cathedral. Um, in 1914, Henry Clay Frick had purchased the land from the Catholic Diocese. Um, he had then tore down what was then uh, St. Paul's and put what was uh, known as the Union Arcade Building on top of it. Um, we held 240 retail shops on the fourth floor um, until uh, 1923. Um, at that time, Henry Clay Frick had passed his estate sold to the Union Trust Company, which was a bank here in Pittsburgh. Uh, they needed a, a bigger headquarters, uh, so they moved from 4th Avenue to uh, here, um, and uh, the first floor remained retail, whereas the upstairs became their offices. Um, it ran that way all the way up until the mid-1960s, um, and then Mellon Bank had uh, taken the building over and uh, ran it as multi-tenant office building. Uh, and that is what we currently are today. Uh, we currently went through a couple of ownership changes, um, and. Um, the style of architecture for the building is called uh, Flemish Gothic, um, and you can see where uh, some of the points uh, uh, in the rotunda come to uh, that Flemish uh, point. Uh, and uh, some of the rosettes, it was all mass molded. It's uh, terracotta, which is a baked clay material. Uh, it could be easily washed during industrial times, and that's why they used it. Um, so uh, we're very well maintained today. Uh, everything is uh, very well kept. Hopefully going into the future, uh, the same. The First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh is one of the oldest Protestant architectures west of the Allegheny Mountains. Roots of Presbyterianism in Pittsburgh go back to 1758 when the British defeated the French at Fort Duquesne at the point of Pittsburgh's Three Rivers. The congregation of the First Church goes back to 1773 when a call went out for its first pastor. Originally, services were held in members' homes until 1787 when 2.5 lots of grounds were given to the congregation by heirs of William Penn through the source, the Act of Legislature of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Later that year, the first building of the church was built using resources available at that time. And as the membership grew, the church was finally able to build an even larger building in 1853, which was then used for another 50 years. Finally, in 1903, the cornerstone for the current building was laid and was completed in 1905 and is still looked at as a turning point for Pittsburgh architecture. The Dollar Bank opened for business in 1870 as the Pittsburgh Dollar Savings Bank, becoming one of the first banks to have opened in Pittsburgh. From the beginning, Dollar Bank was an advanced institution for its time, recognizing property rights for women and people of color. One of the most notable features of this structure, apart from its brass patterns and complex moldings, are the original iconic Dollar Bank hand-carved stone lines that have remained at the entrance since 1870. In 2009, a lengthy restoration project began with the goal of returning the lines to their original state after decades of deterioration. This project resulted in the creation of four new hand-carved stone replicas of the original lines, two being placed inside the building and two guarding the exterior. What was once known as the grandest hotel in the world is now better known as the remarkable Omni William Penn Hotel. The building was built in 1916 by Henry Clay Frick and dedicated to the famous William Penn who was credited with the founding of Pennsylvania. It was crafted in the neoclassical style with the interior of the hotel outfitted in art deco style. Visitors to the hotel will see domed arcs, tough sofas, wooden accents, and a speaksy that evokes the feel of the 1920s. So the William Penn was built in 1916. Um, and then at that time, we had over a thousand rooms. We're down to 605 room nights, I believe, or 605 
um, rooms. We got two separate sides of the building. It's two back, essentially two backwards eaves put together. First side was built um, when the hotel was first erected, and the second side was built later. Um, and the hotel's always been a hotel. To learn more about the architectural and historical aspects of the hotel, Bellman Eric Wilson takes us through some key artifacts through an entertaining tour. My name is Eric. I'm the ghost of the army. I've been here 107 years. <laughs> 612 rooms. Biggest grand ballroom in the city. The tea kettle. The operator. That's when Alexander Graham Bell came out with the telephone. The cashier. All kinds of conventions, presidentials. Bob Hope stayed here. We named the room that room. It's called the Bob Hope Room. Lawrence Welk stayed here. We have a room called the Lawrence Welk. This thing here is for telegrams. If you notice this picture here, a lot of our rooms had two twin beds. Because way back then, your wife slept in one bed and your husband slept in the other bed. Noticeably. Our suite. The old fashioned pajamas. That won't move. This is not the Liberty Bell because it has no crack. Okay. This is where you could save your change. Right inside the hotel. Groundbreaking. Horse and buggy, if you noticed. Official groundbreaking. Okay. Notice the chandeliers. They're still hanging. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every year, right before Christmas, we have a ceremony where they lower them down. And then they have white gloves and tuxedos and they clean each one. And then they raise them up and take a champagne toast. Real good excuse to have a drink. This building also accounted for new technologies of the time. When the Bolton Index in 1937, a source that took note for all the luxuries at William Penn, mentioned the alarm clocks. The alarm clocks in the hotel were connected to the hotel master clock, also known as the Holzer Magneto Clock. This master clock was one of the major advancements of the time, as this piece of technology was able to keep time for the entire hotel, which at the time meant around 1,000 guest rooms. The Frick Building, a major historical landmark, was constructed by and devoted to one of the wealthiest men during the 1920s, Henry Clay Frick. Built directly adjacent to his rival, Andrew Carnegie's building, this structure is a sign of economic prosperity and power in the city of Pittsburgh. At the time, this was the world's tallest building in 1901 when it was built. So it was the first time that elevators went that high on um, 20 stories. It was the first time um, water was pumped that high. The John LaForge painting it was very famous in New York and New Jersey. Um, I think there's only two pieces here in Pittsburgh. It's called Fortune on a Wheel. Um, if you look around here, all this marble here came from Italy. There's a lot of first histories in here. Um, the elevators are Otis. Um, they were the ones, I could say, the first ones to go that high. Mr. Frick was a very powerful and wealthy man at the time. Um, so he bought the quarry company. So, and it's a brilliant move because his order became first and he got it at cost. And then when you're done, he sold the company. The lions here, those are from his daughter. Um, they, she had those installed. And those are to never to be removed from the position where they're at or his bust there. Now the bust right there, there's three of those busts. 
exact same bus. There's one in New York, and then one up at um, Frick Park, and then of course one right here. So those are to never be removed or changed in any ways. You know, he was just as rich as Bill Gates is now. Um, so he didn't like to be told no. When he wanted something, he went out and got it. So just like I said with the marble here, you know, he wanted to get his marble first, so he bought the company. Well, Mr. Frick family got most of their money from Holt Whiskey, which is still on sale today, um, which made it through the prohibition. They were able to continue to sell it because they sold it during prohibition as medicine. So that's where they made a lot of their wealth. Then he made his personal wealth from the coal mines. Um, he made a lot of money off the coal mines. Matter of fact, when he built this building, he had a coal generator installed in the basement here to provide electricity for the building, which was brilliant because he already owned the coal mines. So he just had to put the coal generator in, in which in 1914, the utility companies, they bought the, um, um, the generator off and then, so they took it out and connected to power here. The Pittsburgh City Council building is an architectural masterpiece built in 1917 and is currently in use for civic functions such as city government department meetings and public hearings. Apart from its important usability, the build of the structure is remarkable. Utilizing a mix of the Beaux Arts and neoclassical architectural style, symmetry and classical features are prominent throughout. The grand stairs at the entrance and the limestone facade overall create a sense of monumental scale for the building. Sitting at seven stories tall covering an entire city block, the Pittsburgh City Council building stands as a prominent symbol of the city's civic governance and architectural heritage. It continues to serve as an essential hub for local government activities, playing a crucial role in the administration of the Pittsburgh City. Pittsburgh is widely known as the City of Bridges as Pittsburgh hosts 446 bridges. Long before the majestic bridges soared above the three rivers, Pittsburgh was a rugged terrain of deep valleys, creeks, and rivers, isolating many of the city's residents. According to source Heinz History Center, when the first European settlers arrived in the 1700s, they had to cross streams and climb steep hillsides just to travel around the region. And to overcome these challenges, the settlers built wooden bridges to connect newly constructed roadways and span the rivers and valleys. The city's first river crossing bridge, the Monongahela Bridge, was built in 1818 on the site of what is today the Smithfield Street Bridge. Throughout the 1900s, as the region's population boomed, Pittsburgh waged a massive road and a bridge campaign with the development of the interstate highway system. The result was a variety of bridge designs, including suspensions, cantilever, and arc, mostly produced from the local steel. Most recognizable is the only trio of identical bridges in the world, the Roberto Clemente, Andy Warhol, and Rachel Carson suspension bridges, which helped carry traffic across the Allegheny River to the Pittsburgh's north side. These and hundreds of other Pittsburgh bridges not only connect our region's neighborhoods and residents, but also add to the city's unique and beautiful skyline.